All right, welcome to another episode of Peter and Code. My name is Peter, and this is the second part of the two part series about the hexagonal and onion architecture and the combination, which is the explicit architecture. So if you haven't seen the first part of this two part series yet, please go back to the first part, which I will link somewhere here and make sure to watch that because it gives you the theoretical background and context that you need to understand what I'm programming in this episode. So in this episode, part two of the series, I will talk about and I will implement the explicit architecture in Elixir. Just to give you a context again, I showed you this graph the last time about the onion architecture, and this will be our guideline for this video as well. So I will start in the middle with the domain model. I will pro program that, explain a little bit about it, then go to the domain service and the application service. So I move from inside to outside. Generally, if you, if you um, want to write your application and you want to adhere to this architecture, you can use two approaches to writing your code. One of them is inside out, the other one is outside in. I personally prefer neither of those, um, but I most usually use inside out. And that means that you start in the middle of your application in the very core. So you start with your domain model and then you work your way outside. You always work your way to the outside. So you write the domain service then next and then you write the application service next. And then you write some interacting parts uh, and you also write the technical dependencies like repositories and so on. And the advantage of this approach is that you can write tests while you go along and your tests will always be green. They will always be successful while you build up your application. Because the other way around, if you go outside in, you first write your interacting parts, then your application services, your domain services if you need some, and then the domain model. But none of that will be green, will be successful. So none test of that will be successful until you write the very last element that you need for that. So which is mostly then the domain model. So in that case, you would start with your interacting parts, write tests for it, but the test will fail um, until you finish your application and you end up in the middle and only then all the tests will be successful. So I personally prefer the inside out, out approach, but I, I vary depending on the, the task that I have. But for this video, I will use the inside out approach. So I will start in the middle with the domain model and then work my way outside. But without further ado, let's dive into it. Let's go into the editor and write some code. All right, and we are back in the editor. I created a small demo application that I will use to present to you the explicit architecture. As always, you can find this code on GitHub at pjulrich slash code, but I will also link to it in the video description below. So let's get started. First, as I said, we work inside out. So we start with the domain model first. And for that, I will in my app folder, create a new folder called domain models. That's um, my usual style that I create folders for the um, module types that I'm creating. So in here, I will put all my domain models. And in the domain models folder, I will create another folder called user. And in that one, we create a user uh, module. And the user module will use a uh, macro that I specified. I also usually specify my macros in my app EX or in my uh, project EX. And I create these macros here where I can specify some uh, standards, some, some uh, yeah, standard imports and attributes and uh, functions. And then I reuse this macro using that you usually see in the app web um, module. So in here you see there's a, a function, a little helper function that helps you to apply all these imports and aliases to the module that uses these macros. So in our case, I um, created a domain model macro that I will now use in here. So I just do this. And now I have specified this module as being a domain model model module, excuse me. <laughs> so one thing that you might have seen already is in my case, I tend to use the Ecto schema inside my domain models. This is theoretically a little bit 
disputed, so to say, because your domain model should actually have no technical dependency except for your language itself. So it should only use the language built in functionality and not any technical dependency. Because as I explained in the first video, you want to move all your techni technical dependencies to the outside so that you can change them uh, if you need to. And the application core in which also the domain model lies should not be dependent on that technology. But in my case, Acto and Postgres is such a fundamental dependency that I made the trade-off or the decision to allow my domain models to rely on Acto schema and um, the Acto library. So I understand that if I ever have to remove Acto from this project, I would have to rip out that out of my domain models and do some translation in, for example, the repository from a struct to a schema. But for now, this is my decision and it helps me a lot to not have to map always a user struct to a user schema whenever I uh, fetch or update or delete a user in the database. So in my case, a domain model is equal to an Acto schema, which is why in my user domain model, I will define this as a users, for example, and just I will keep this demo really simple. Um, I will give the user only a one field, which is his or her age, and that should be an integer. And that's it. And of course, I need to write a migration for that. In which I then create the table users with a field. And now let me just run my migration, but I have to create the database first and now I can run my migration. There we go, we have a table called users that have an H integer in it. And this is it. This is the first domain model um, with a schema. So you know exactly what kind of data you should have in this domain model. However, what I do not want to rely on is the Acto change set, um, but I want to do this checking manually. So I will create a constructor for this user domain model, which is called new and I will use a keyword list to specify the RP, the like the public function of this module, in which I require it to have an H. And for that H, I want to have the specification that it should be an integer. Whoops, H. So now I can um, create this domain model with an HH, and that is it. And then I will just return the struct to the outside uh, component that called this. So you see, I don't do any changes here. I don't do any casting here. Um, that complexity I did not want to have in a domain model. So I don't want to add the complexity of Acto uh, change set in here. I could do that or you could do that if you wanted to, if it helps you and if it makes your life easier. Just um, yeah, be aware that you add more complexity to your domain model that you would potentially need to extract at one point in time again. So make the decision for yourself and think whether that is um, a trade-off where you have a, more of a win than a lose. But in my case now I created this constructor so you can create a user and I want to add one function that has some business logic inside of it. It's very simple but I want to add one function that is called update h and what you're getting here is you get a, a user and you get a new age, which should also be a integer. Oh, excuse me, new age. So, and in this case, what I want to do is to check that the new age is above a certain threshold, because let's say that our system can only be used by adults, so they have to be eighteen year olds, uh, eighteen year old or older. And I could, of course, do the business logic in the guard here, which I will also do. I will just require the new age to be equal or larger to 18. And if that is the case, I will return a new user. There's a user inside of it. And I update the age with the new age. This is it. So I told you in the first part that you use the domain model to move all the business logic that applies to that domain model inside this mod uh, module. 
so that you don't leak your business logic that applies, uh, that is connected to this domain model, to this entity or to this value object, so that you don't leak that business logic anywhere else into your system. Because now let's, this is a business rule here. This is a business rule that was given to me by my uh, product owner, for example, who said that our users have to be 18 year olds, 18 year old or older. So this is real business logic. And you don't want to have that in like floating around in your system. You want to have that in one particular place where you can look it up and where you can also easily change it. So now my, the rest of my system doesn't need to care about whether a user is 18 year, olds or 18 year old or older because um, they will know that whenever you update the age, um, you, it cannot be any other state than this. There cannot be any other state uh, where a user is 17 year, uh, 17 year olds or younger. But that reminds me that we also have to check this business rule when we create the user. So let's just extract these two guards into a private function, which is something called like set age, and it will receive a um, user and it will receive an age. And in here we can do our guards while we're checking where we say it should also be equal or larger to 18. And if that is the case, then we return the user with this and a new age. And now we can use this function in here, simply say set age with the user and the new age. And we don't need to have these two guards here anymore. And also here we can create a, a raw user, so to say, and then also pass that one to the set age function with the age and also this guard is not needed anymore. So now we have our business logic in one place, which is the set age function. Setting age, it's not a good name, to be honest, like you should not have that many functions in your domain model where you only set and update um, or delete properties of your struct or fields of your struct. If you do that, you end up quickly with bloodless domain models, also called anemic blood, um, anemic domain models, excuse me, which do not have any business logic inside, but only getters and setters. And that goes against the idea of um, moving your business logic into the domain model. Um, if the domain model is simply um, a schema or like just a struct without any, uh, any business logic that applies to it. So if that is a case, if you, if you have a domain model and you end up just uh, setting and getting things in here, you should think again about whether this thing that you're having there is actually a domain model. It's actually like a core element of your business or not. Because apparently your business doesn't care that much about this element since you don't have that much business logic about it. So that's the problem of an anemic or bloodless domain model. Um, yeah, I can recommend also reading up on that a bit more. But in our case, I, I understand that this might look like uh, a bloodless or an anemic domain model, but we have at least one business rule in here, which is the age needs to be older, uh, larger or equal to 18. So, excuse me, this might be still a bloodless domain model, but let's just go with this for now, which um, yeah brings me to the point where I can finish this domain model here. We have set our schema, uh, we can create a new domain model and we can update the age. So now, Let's jump one step ahead and write an application service first. I do not have any business logic right now that needs a domain service. So that's why I'm leaving it out. In general, in my experience, you don't use that many domain services, but it always depends on your use case. If you have very complex business logic, including a lot of domain models, you will also have a, a, a more domain services, of course. Um, but in my case, for this demo now, I don't need a domain service here for setting an age because I can simply call the user domain model directly. So let's just write the first application service then. Again, I will create a folder here, which is called application services. I will create a folder for the set user age service. Oh, I cannot see it. So in here, create a set user age service and create a module for that. All right. So in here, again, I use my application service 
a macro that I defined in the app EX for that. So now I specified that this module is an application service. So this set user age service is um, an interface or will offer the interface to the outside world. So it will offer the interface to our controllers um, and other interacting parts that will need to set a user's age. So this application service then will write, uh, will offer one public function, which is for example called set age. And what I want here is I want a user ID and I want an a new age, so to say. All right. And what I want to give back in this case is I want I simply want to give back an OK. Um, there is also a discussion about if you update a user, if you update a, an entity and store it to the database, should you then also give back that um, that user struct or not? Or should you just give an, back an OK? Um, th there are people who argue that you should give back the updated entity. And there are people who argue you should not um, give back the updated entity, but rather uh, rely on command query separation, uh, CQS. There's also a CQRS uh, thing. But the command query separation is basically you have one call making a com uh, executing command, which is, for example, set the age. And then if that command is correct, then you give back, uh, you give back an OK or like a, a successful message. And then you have a second set of, of commands or actions you can do, which are queries. So uh, you, you query then for the new updated user entity, so to say. And by separating the writing from the reading actions in your application, you might also eventually end up with a more performant um, application. And also um, the actual actions themselves don't become that complex anymore. So if you have to update the database and at the same time read from it, you might also end up with some race conditions and whatnot. And by simply separating your, your writing operations, the, the commands from the uh, querying operations, from the read operations, um, you, you forego, you prevent a lot of race conditions, a lot of complexity and so on. So in, in my case, I will adhere to that. I will, I will split the writing from the reading um, operations. So in my case, set age is a writing operation. So I want to update an entity in the database. And after I've done that, I will simply return a success. So CQS, CQIS is a whole different topic. Again, if you want to read up more on that, please go ahead. I can highly recommend it. Um, but for now, let's just stick to the simple use case with one writing application, uh, one writing action. So I told you in the first part that application services rather control the flow than applying any actions themselves. And the flow of this use case set user age is basically just fetch the user, give it to the user domain model for updating, and then persist the updated version of the user again. So I will do that here with a with statement so that if any of these steps goes wrong, I will return that um, error message to the outside um, part, the, the calling component in this case. So I will use the user repo that I have to write in a, in a bit. I will give it a, a get function simply with a user ID. Let me just move this here. So now we have our uh, with statement. Then once I have the user entity, I want to give it to the domain model. So I will also, uh, let's call it updated user. I will also um, expect the updated entity back. So I will call the user domain model and call the set age function with the user and the new age. And eventually I will call the persist function, which also gives me back the updated user on the user repo. Ah, I can just call it update with the updated user. There we go. So this is our workflow. We fetch it, we update it, and then we uh, store it to the, to the database again. So let's just write some aliases here so that we don't forget that. And I want the user as well. So now I have the user here and we also need to have a user rep uh, repository. So I will create a new folder called repositories. And I will create a user 
repository in there and call it user repository. Well, actually, let me abbreviate that user repo. So now we create this module. Whoops. And we have to create, uh, first of all, let me use the macro again. So that um, gives us the repository, for example, has the query in here and it aliases the repo. So we can get started right away. And I need two functions. I need a get function with a user ID. And I need a function called update of a user. All right, and let's first implement this function, which is rather easy. We can simply use the uh, repo and call the get function with a user and the user ID. I need to alias that here though. Okay, and uh, you, you've seen that I changed a bit the return result from the get function here. I usually do this so that I don't have to do something like uh, user user when not is nil in here. Like this is what I would have to do if I wouldn't return an okay or error from the get function here. Um, because I want to make sure that this is not nil, that the user was actually found. So I usually create a, a tuple that returns an okay and a user if it was found and an error, um, error not found if it was not found. So in this case, if it's nil, I return error, error, sorry, and say user not found. And if I have a user, I return okay and the user. There we go. So in this case, if it wasn't found, um, the with statement here will uh, break, will say, well, this is not what I expect, and will return the user not found error to the outside, uh, to the calling component, to the controller or whatnot. So we have an early, uh, early fail here as well. And now the second function that I need to do is update the user. So since I moved away the change set casting stuff from the domain model, I need to do it here in the repository. So what I want to do first, I want to define the valid fields that I want to persist to the database. And in this case, the user struct so far has only one field, which is the H field. So I define it here. And then what I want to do if I update a user, um, I want to get all the values of the user. So I take the user and I take the valid fields. And now I have all the data that a user struct holds, except for the ID. And um, to, to update a user, I will simply create a, a, a user struct that doesn't hold any data, but the ID of the user. Then I will cast the values uh, to the valid fields. So the H in this case will be cast to the, uh, to the H in the user uh, chain set. And now I will simply call the repo update function. All right. And if I use this now, um, yeah, I will take all the data that is inside this user struct. I will uh, create a new user struct that holds the same ID, so it will be overwritten. Uh, and then I cast the values, and in this case, uh, it will be updated. All right, one thing that we need still to make the whole thing testable and, and round is we need to have a persist function that uh, stores or persists a new user for this. So in this case, we can simply take the user, we cast nothing, no new values to it, um, the valid fields, and then we call repo insert. So this way we can simply persist the user that we created from a domain model. Um, one quick note though, normally I would write tests along the way. I like to do TDD, test-driven development, so I would write the test first before I write the domain model or the application service, for example. So you write the test first, then you write the module with its functions, and then you try to make the test pass. And after you made the test pass, you refactor. Um, to keep this video rather short, I left out the tests for now, and I will probably make another video about TDD with Elixir in the future. So this is our user repository. Um, now we can use it in the application service. Just a quick note about the repository and the, the overarching idea of having replaceable uh, technical dependencies. We use the user repo, 
user repo to make any calls to our database, to our persistence layer from anywhere in the application service or uh, application core. So if we would need to replace our, pers our persistence layer or a, uh, our database, for example, or something, uh, maybe we want to move away from Postgres and something uh, to something like a MongoDB, then we could only do that in the user repo here. So we would need to migrate our data, of course, but then we can simply um, update the repo insert, repo get, and repo update functions here. And then we would um, be able to switch away from Postgres, uh, sorry, Postgres and towards MongoDB. So by simply writing this user repo, we give our application core an adapter to the, uh, to the database, to the persistence layer. And I told you in the first part that the hexagonal architecture has ports and adapters. Now ports, as I said, are interfaces, are behaviors. In this case, what I could do now, I could write uh, in the user thing, I could write a, a um, user uh, port, for example. I could do this. Now I could write some callbacks here, like for the persist function, which takes in an app user and returns either a okay with an app user or it returns an error with an ecto chain set. And then in the user repo, I would say behavior, it should implement the behavior of the user port. But to be honest, I must say that this ports and adapter idea is very influenced by the Java and C sharp community. Um, also, if you look at the example code that they always give is Java code. And in their case, it's important to have interfaces defined like this and then have adapters that implement these interfaces because in Java, you have static typing. Um, and so you can use interfaces much better um, to ensure that an adapter or like a repository in this case actually implements the functions that you expect. In Elixir though, we have soft typing with duck typing, we don't have static typing. Um, so this user port interface stuff would only help us with our uh, static uh, code analysis with Credo, for example, or with Dialyzer. Um, and yeah, it, it can maybe help you. And if it helps you and you use type specs and you want to add these interfaces, you can do what I just showed you. I must say that I personally don't use them that often because I rather try to keep my, uh, my adapters small so that you only have a couple of functions in there. And if they get too large, then I would rather split them up. And by doing that, I can, I don't need an interface per se. I can simply go to the repo and look at these three functions, really look at the parameters. And if I were to replace, let's say this user repo implementation. So this adapter with another adapter, I would simply replicate these functions with the same parameters in the new adapter. So this is more like a practical approach, I would say, um, because also these repositories, they don't, don't tend to change that much for me after I've written the, the helper functions that I need. But um, I just want to let you know that according to the, the official definition of ports and adapters, having an interface like this and then having it as a behavior in here would be uh, the more correct approach, I think. Because now you have, yeah, you have the definition of what this user repo should do. And if you want to replace this adapter now, you can simply have another fun another module that implements this behavior. And you know that if it implements the behavior, you know that you successfully replaced this user repo. Now that is all I had to say about the repository being an adapter for the user port slash interface. So now let's move back to the application service because I realized there were one or two mistakes I made. First of all, um, I called a set h function here, which I just replaced, but it was called this. It should be an update h function. And I also don't return a tuple here of the, uh, from the update h function, but only the updated user. Usually I always try to use the okay and error tuple notification, um, uh, notation, excuse me. So I uh, would also like to do this here, but just for the update h function, I would also do it for this one. Um, so like this, and then you say, okay, and you got the user back. All right, now this is set. Um, let me just 
rename this function also to update age to have the same uh, uh, call signatures here. And then the updated user is not needed anymore. This has been our first application service that we've written. Um, you see that this update age function is your adapter to the outside world. So if you have a controller, the controller would call this function. Again, it, if we wanted to adhere to the uh, ports and adapter definition, the more like Java influence definition, we would also write a behavior for this application service that simply states that there is a public function with is, which is called update age and it, it uh, expects a keyword list uh, as an input and returns an okay or an error. But since uh, it would be a bit um, laborious to do that now, I will just leave that out. Again, if you wanted to do it yourself, you can write uh, an interface for this, a behavior, and then you would have implemented the real definition of the hexagonal architecture. But let me just uh, finish up the uh, onion and the hexagonal architecture a bit by creating a controller um, that will call this application service, simply call it the RP controller, and it is in the app web namespace, app web controller. There. And now let's say that we have uh, an action here, which is called um, set user, for example, it gets a connection and it gets as a parameter, a user ID and a new age. Okay, now we first have to pass the new age. You can do that with the change set if you wanted to, but in my case, I will just uh, use the string to integer function to integer of the new age, All right? And now we could call the application service, which I will just alias here, user age update service, and uh, do the update age function for the user ID and user ID and the new age. And now we can uh, pipe that, well, not, we could pipe that, I would just pipe it for now. Uh, you could also, um, maybe I will pipe it for now. So I will do this. I will say, if it's okay, then you render a connection like a success HTML, for example, if you had that. And if there's an error um, with the chain set, if there's any error, uh, then you can just present like a error uh, message if you had that. Whatever you can you can do with the return whatever you wanted to. So now that's the uh, the controller. So you see now we have an API controller that offers a set user function with a user ID and a new age. Uh, you see that there's no business logic in this anymore except for some parsing and then just calling the update age function. Um, yeah, if we wanted to replace this API controller now with like a view controller. Yeah, in this case, actually, we just have to copy paste this function to the other controller, but we don't need to change our business logic at all. Like it will always stay in this service and it will stay in the very core in the user domain model. So you don't, you, for example, you don't see that we check uh, whether the new age is larger or equal to 18 here. We leave that to the domain model. All right, and there is one element that I have not discussed yet, which is a domain service. And I told you that the domain service takes multiple uh, domain models and applies some business logic to these with these domain models and one to one or multiple of these domain models. So it just inter it just manages the uh, business logic that includes or applies multiple domain models. In our case, let's do a simple example again, where in the domain models, we cr create a new domain model, which is called country age policy and the country age policy policy there we go is also a um, a domain model that gives us some information about the minimum age of our user because uh, some things are regulated differently in different countries for example drinking uh, here in Germany, I think you can drink beer and wine when you're 16. 
at least when I was young, it was 16, maybe it's 18 now. Uh, I think it's 18. And then in America, it's 21 and it's, it's different in different countries. So in our case, we want to, um, if we set the age of a user, we want to check that um, the user age is not always equal to 18, like we hard coded it here, because it depends on the country that a user lives in. So for that, we will simply hard code a couple of policies here, which is a map that holds key values of the country code and the respective minimum age policy for something. So in Germany it would be, for example, 18. And then in Australia, let's say there's something that you can do with eight, with 16. Um, then there would be a function simply called get policy, whoops, with a country code. And it returns the country code here. So it takes policies and returns the age. So now we want to change this requirement over here of the user. First of all, we want to, uh, sorry, the requirement. I realize you can can't see it if my, my little window is above it. So uh, we want to change the requirement over here that if you are 18, you must be 18 or older because this will now be depend on the country that you live in. And for that, we first need to see in which country you live in. So let's move it over here. Let's say uh, country code of residence, dense, and that's a string. Okay. And if you create a new, uh, new user, um, you also have to do that. Yeah, I know it's really long. But sometimes a variable that is very long and, and verbose is most accurate and explains exactly what you mean. In this case, I think this is exactly what I want. So it, it looks terrible. I won't refactor it right now. Actually, let's, let me refactor it just a tiny bit. Set country code of residence with this. Then I can remove it here. Simply make it here. Residence and it replies. So, whoop. Okay, now we have it in a pipe and maybe it looks better. I don't know. But we could also say like uh, this again, we could do some policies here. We could say, well, a country, the, the only allowed countries uh, right now for our service uh, is um, are the three countries that I said earlier. So we could, let me just move up this a bit. We could uh, also add some business logic here. If we say like country code in uh, USA, Germany or Australia, right? And now we again added some business lo logic to our domain model. But our main focus was to replace this part here, the add age. And uh, let me s move this one away. We still want to check that this age is actually an integer though if we would persist it in the database, uh, it would be turned into an integer if it was a string. Um, but the domain model again is checks its state itself as well. So you should not rely on third party tools for uh, transforming any data here, but you should always expect exactly the data that you want here. All right, so this is this new set age function. We removed it here. And now I will create a domain service that takes these two domain models, the country age policy and the user, and update the user age depending on the country the user lives in. So let's uh, not domain model, sorry, let me do it over here. Create a main service and it will be the update user age uh, service. Okay, can this. And it is a domain service. Now this again is the, you defining the RP of the domain layer here that you want to expose to the application layer above. So um, you should also make sure that you only require what you really need and that you keep the RP as small as possible because then if you don't have any extra data here, you also don't need to change it. Uh, the, you, you limit the possibilities that you would need to change this RP for. So in our case, everything I want to uh, receive here, 
uh, first of all, it will be um, update age function. And everything I want to receive here is a user and a new age. So I will uh, require this and I will require this. Now I could also do some some uh, type checking here if I were to add like a user thing here that I check, okay, this should be an app user and so on. That's usually also a good idea. Also when you say here, uh, when it's integer. So now this, now we defined also the parameters that we expect in this domain service, uh, which is our RP to the, to the application layer. So now the application layer knows exactly a, what it needs to put in into this function so that we can do our our logic. Okay, so with the user and the new age, um, the first thing that I want to do is get the minimum age policy from the country age policy domain model. So I have the user and the user has a country code. So I will get the policy from the, let me first alias it here, country, come on. And while I'm at it, let me also use this one. Then we can refactor this a bit. So now we can do the country. I can't write today. Get policy for the user country code of residence. All right. And now this is the not the policy, but this is a minimum age require met. I think this is what you would call it. And now we can do some business logic in here. Uh, we say case uh, the new age is equal or larger than the minimum age requirement do if that is true then we want to call the user module with the update age of the user and the new age and if it is false then we will simply return an error uh, which is um, minimum age requirement not met for example there we go and also this should probably be a tuple I like to use tuples. There we go. Now you've seen what a domain service is and what can it do for you. Um, it takes, in this case, only one domain model, but the business logic you want to apply to that domain model also needs to take into account another domain model. So it includes the second domain model as well. That's why you use the domain service for that. Um, and uh, we, yeah, got the user, we got the minimum age requirement for that user's country. We, this is our business logic here. Basically, this is just checking whether the new age uh, is equal or larger than the minimum age requirement. If it's not, then we return error. So this is our business logic here. And um, yeah, that's the domain service, basically. All right, this has been it. This has been the walk through the coding session of the explicit architecture. I hope that you liked it. I hope that you learned a bit. Um, I couldn't get into that much detail because it is a broad topic. There are many things that you can learn about it. Um, so I just wanted to give you a, a glimpse into the topic and point you into a certain direction where you can uh, further your knowledge after this video. So thank you very much for listening and being with me here. Uh, I will upload that code again to GitHub where you can find it as well and, and walk through it yourself. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me on Twitter. It is at Peter and Code. Or I also have an Elixir forum thread where you can uh, also respond to and ask me questions there. If you have any topics that you would like me to cover in the future, please also contact me through these channels and I will put them on the list and uh, do that in the near future as well. All right, thank you very much again for being with me. Um, I hope you learned a lot. I wish you a great day and happy coding, as people say.